So once again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am Justine Khalil, Assistant Curator at the Power Plant and the Curator of Howie Choi's exhibition, From Swelling Shadows We Draw Our Bows. Thank you again for joining us this Monday evening for an in-conversation program featuring Howie and art historian and curator Rhiannon Vogel. Before we begin, I ask that you join me in acknowledging the history, culture, and stewardship of the land of the Indigenous people of this region, most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit and Mississauga Ojibwe First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live and work upon their traditional territory. So when the pandemic first reached Canada uh, about six months ago, or maybe more accurately when everything kind of hit the fan, um, the power plant quickly shifted its fall 2020 season to focus on three talented Canadian artists. So when the power plant reopens its doors on Saturday, September 26th, in addition to the exhibition of Vancouver-based artist Howie Choi's work, we will open exhibitions by Montreal-based artist Manuel Mathieu and Hamilton-based artist Nathan Eugene Carson. And we really do hope to welcome you all back to the gallery. We have procedures in place to make sure everyone feels safe and welcome, including cleaning high frequency touch points and mandatory mask wearing and timed entry. So we do hope that you'll stop by to check out these shows. The Power Plant appreciates an ongoing partnership with OCAD University, who co-present one artist program in the fall season and one in the winter season, and who are partnering with us tonight to present Howie's In Conversation with Rhiannon. Under normal circumstances, these programs would take place on OCAD U's campus, but safety precautions because of the coronavirus mean that we are online for the foreseeable future. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stephen Foster, Dean of the Faculty of Art at OCAD University, to say a few words. Hi, thank you. Thank you, uh, Justin. Um, yeah, um, just to, before we go on, I'd also like to recognize um, the traditional territory holders of the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, whose uh, territory OCAD sits and where we work, live, and create. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize our urban Indigenous communities in Toronto and in OCAD, as well as our Métis communities. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. It's, uh, um, it's a, been a, a very interesting uh, and long uh, relationship that uh, Power Plant has had with OCAD U. Um, and uh, we are very excited to partner on this particular event. And uh, we're also looking forward to future events, uh, um, virtual and uh, in person when they permit. Uh, we um, at OCAD U, uh, of course, we're uh, responding to the various challenges of COVID and the pandemic presented us with. And uh, we've uh, continued our programming and uh, studio uh, um, courses. But uh, we've been uh, presenting them online for uh, since uh, May uh, and all through the summer and now uh, fall. It was the first, uh, first uh, full semester of uh, studio delivery online for our institution. Um, we're hoping uh, along with our normal studio courses that we're presenting online, we're hoping to do um, a variety of events over the fall, uh, remotely, deliver remotely of course, um, and I'm hoping that uh, you uh, will be able to attend. So thank you. Keep an eye out for them as they come up. That's, uh, that's all I've got. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Dean Foster. Really appreciate those remarks. And we're always happy to partner with OCAD. As one of Canada's premier art and design universities, we know that you're as dedicated to contemporary art as the power plant is. So before I formally introduce tonight's program, I'd like to extend thanks to a few additional people who have helped make it possible. First and foremost, to Gaytan Verna, the director of the power plant and our fearless leader, for putting me in touch with Howie many months ago and for her immense support along the way. And to my colleagues, Josh Human, Laura Demers, and Blair Swan for coordinating aspects of this program and working diligently behind the scenes to ensure that it runs smoothly. Also, of course, to Howie and Rhiannon for their generosity of spirit and for uh, being willing to adapt this program to be presented online. We really appreciate you working with us on this front. 
And last but certainly not least, special thanks to the generous donors and supporters who have made the exhibition possible. To our support donors, Catherine Barbaro and Tony Grossi, to our donors, Jennifer Grant and David Daddles, as well as to Art Labor, Panasonic and Patel Brown Gallery, thank you. So I'll talk a little bit about um, Howie's exhibition at the power plant and the work that you'll see before I introduce um, Howie and Rhiannon by reading their bios. So growing up between Hong Kong, Lagos and Thunder Bay, Howie has described his childhood and adolescence as existing within a liminal zone on the threshold of Chinese and colonial cultures. His artworks, however, have long displayed strong connections to Hong Kongese aesthetics. In fact, upon revisiting the city in 2010, he remarked that Hong Kong's unique spatial qualities were subconsciously present in his work, stating, my obsessions with windows and reflective surfaces, density, kinetic energy, movement, maximalism. In Hong Kong, all my nostalgic synapses were firing. His blending of classical and contemporary Chinese art and architecture with Western popular culture has resulted in a series of works that examine the complexities of the diasporic experience while simultaneously questioning official Chinese culture. The exhibition from Swelling Shadows, We Draw Our Bows, brings together for the first time works in several different media to explore fully the artist's multi-layer drawing practice, from the seminal five-channel algorithmic animation Retainers of Anarchy, to lenticular and Endura prints in light boxes and site-specific drawings, or frescoes, as Howie likes to call them, in the Clara story. I have had the immense privilege of working with him to organize this exhibition, which definitely explores the entangled history of China and Britain and questions the Chinese government's creeping suppression of thought, particularly in Howie's birth city of Hong Kong. Um, indeed, I'd say with mainland China's new security law coming into effect on June 30th of this year, a law that makes it more difficult for Hong Kongers to peacefully protest and exercise free speech and even to vote, Howie's work has never been more urgent. The drawings, animations, and prints that you'll see at the power plant reference this recent history through the lens of wuxia, a popular form of martial arts literature that emerged in China during the mid 20th century, and one that advocates for resistance and dissidence within the shadows. So those liminal spaces, like those that emerge as members of the diaspora shift between cultures, where one can find the tools to fight against injustice, untruths, and fear. So tonight, Rhiannon and Howie will engage in conversation for approximately 40 minutes, after which they will begin to incorporate questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, but please hold your questions until Rhiannon announces it's time to submit them, just to make things a little bit easier for everybody. So it's my great pleasure to now introduce our two speakers. Howie Choi currently lives and works in Vancouver, Canada. Recent solo exhibitions include the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida in 2020, OCAT Museum in Jiang, China in 2018, and the Vancouver Art Gallery in 2017. Select group exhibitions include the Asian Art Fair in Paris in 2019, the Ottawa Art Gallery in 2018, and Art Labor Shanghai in 2015. Howie received Canada Council's Joseph Stauffer Prize in 2005 and was long listed for the Sobe Art Award in 2018. He holds a BFA from the University of Waterloo. Nanan Vogel is an independent writer and PhD student in art history at the University of Toronto, where she researches postmodern art writing. Rhiannon has written for Fiden, Border Crossings, Black Flash, and Canadian Art, and published essays in David R. Harper, A Mouse Shaped Room, and James Kirkpatrick, Secret Base by the Lake. From 2008 to 2018, she was a curator of contemporary art at the National Gallery of Canada, where her exhibitions included Kiki Smith and Tony Smith, Masterpiece in Focus in 2016, New Lines, Contemporary Drawing from the NGC in 2014, and the annual Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts Exhibitions from 2011 to 2018. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce or invite our two speakers to come on and start talking a little bit about Howie's work and the exhibition at the power plant. Thank you. Hi, Howie. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Yeah, it's too many faces earlier. This is I more. Know. Um, so you are in Toronto right now working on the installation, is that correct? I am. And how's that going? It's, it's, it's going according to schedule. It's, a, it's been a tight uh, window of coming down and um, get the install done, do some of this public program stuff, 
Um, and because it's COVID, it's a little different. I don't normally have, I don't have my team, my usual team with me, which is a, a Wade Thomas, who's a really good technician. Um, and Remy um, is a programmer I collaborate with. And he's a media artist. So neither of them are with me, but the team here at the power plant, Super Pro, just translated all the instructions and everything is looking really good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and so the show opens to the public on Saturday, correct? Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't seen it. Um, I've seen parts of work that are in the show um, previous, but it will be a um, kind of an unveiling for me too um, to see it as well. But I was also thinking about how tonight is probably the closest in geographical location that you and I have been in quite some time. Um, you, you live in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. Eight, um, I think eight years. Yeah. And um, for me, this is a really wonderful opportunity um, to get to talk to you about your work in this public forum, um, having kind of known you and your work, I think, for almost a decade, if not a little longer. Yeah. Yeah. Back yeah. In, in the, I think it would be the aughts. Yeah. Like Ottawa. The aughts in Ottawa. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm all grown up now. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> My work has like life insurance associated to it and oh. other insurance and <laughs> monthly fees. Monthly fees. Yeah. Just like a Time Life Warner subscription. Yeah. All those uh, subscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> so we did something, we decided to do something a little bit different for tonight. Um, we chatted the other day uh, when you were still in Vancouver and we th were thinking about ways of how to kind of jazz up um, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the normal artist talk that you tend to give. Um, and so you gave me permission to go into your usual artist talk PowerPoint and kind of move it around a little bit and make some connections that I saw and maybe do something that might surprise you a little bit or just give a little bit of room for some spontaneity um, in this discussion. So I've done that. And I think what I'll do is go ahead and share my screen. Um, and we can get started. Cool. Yes, I, you do the he heavy lifting. And then that was why I like the concept so much. <laughs> uh, okay. So this should work. All right. Um, so I've started it chronologically, I think. Um, and I was wondering if maybe we could just start with you telling me what What's going on in this picture? This is a photo of um, me and my sister in an area of um, Hong Kong Island called Tai Gusing, which is kind of, at that time, I think was a, a newer estate. This was like in the mid eighties, uh, looks like about 84. And this was during a period when I think I was moving back and forth between Lagos, where our family was kind of living because my dad was working there and then during the summers or we'd go back to Hong Kong very frequently for um, let's say the mid-autumn festival which is coming up or various holidays and also in the summer I had to go to like we went because we had no school in Lagos in the summer so I'd go back to Hong Kong in the summers and stuff like that so yeah and that's my sister who you know uh, I love dearly. So so growing up, you had um, an unusually international childhood from the from the start. Yeah, we did a lot of traveling. Like I have all these like very formative memories of just sleeping on the ground on a plane because I was like pretty small, and my parents were like, "Oh, the seat's not super comfy," so they would make me this little ground nest, <laughs> and I would just sleep on the floor of like airplanes, like KLM flights. And I always remember we'd land and there'd be always applause because like at that time, um, the international airport out of Hong Kong was the, the Kai Tak airport and it has the most notorious 
high wire landing sequence where you fly really close to buildings. And once you see a checkerboard on a mountain, the pilot has to jack the plane right. And then, and then there's a very short runway. So sometimes uh, airplanes would skid off the runway and land in the water. But I always remember those landings because my mom would hold my arm really tight. And then once we landed, everyone would clap like it was like, you know, a symphony had ended, like a, a piece of, anyways, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to transition other than to say, um, I guess then you, you and your family took an airplane um, another time and ended up <laughs> landing in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we landed in Thunder Bay. I remember that one. I think we flew out of Toronto here, but you took a very small plane and you land on, there's no like taxi thing. You're just like on the strip and it was in the winter. And I remember that was the first time I saw my breath. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, landed in Thunder Bay. And look at these images of my dad's video cassette manufacturing company, which didn't do too well after a while. And then, yo, my Michael Jordan uh, baseball jersey that I got in Duluth, Minnesota, probably. My citizenship card. Um, so tell me a little bit more about um, the way that your dad's videotape manufacturing company kind of played into keeping you tied back to, back to Hong Kong. Yeah, I think it's just you know, his work allowed us to more access to video cassettes, like video cassettes at the time, you know, for us, because my dad was company was manufacturing them. They were quite um, abundantly accessible. So we'd get these shipments of TV series from Hong Kong. And um, these are like 80 episode, 40 episode epic TV shows and a collection of movies. And um, we just watch them in the basement in Thunder Bay, but they, you know, they kept us tethered to Hong Kong culture in this, in the 80s and 90s, which is now looking back, considered one of the halcyon days of cultural production in Hong Kong. Because at that period, um, you know, 97, the handover was not super close yet. And you know, Britain, Britain's kind of colonial grip on it was also loosening. Hong Kong was kind of like feeling itself and getting weird, um, doing its own thing. So it was, it was like a high point of like independence uh, mixed with like hyper capitalism of the 80s, like, and, um, and then just idiosyncratic ideas. And, and um, you know, I think that formed a lot of my visual language that I apply to my art practice. Um, so what was it like growing up in Thunder Bay? Um, I know you and I are both from small towns in Northern Ontario, and we've talked about that a little bit, but what was it like um, immigrating there and kind of having that tie back to Hong Kong and then also I'm sure wanting to at least a little bit try to fit in with Northern Ontario kids which are a special breed in and of ourselves. Yeah my neighborhood friends were great and super welcoming. Um, they knocked on my door when I arrived and they're like hey let's go play. So for me the assimilation part in Northern Ontario wasn't wasn't too troubling but I think what was troubling or taxing was that experience for my parents mm. you know my dad grew up in shanghai and my mom grew up in hong kong and then they're in thunder bay and they're very social people and they're all that lack of um stimulus i think would drive them into other vices or other ways of kind of expressing their energy. Um, so I think it was very difficult for them, that kind of space. And there's not much of a Chinese Canadian community in Thunder Bay. So, you know, there'd be periods when we were all kind of connected and there'd be ma late Mahjong games at people's houses and all the kids would run around and play like crazy, hopped up on sugar until three in the morning. But 
and there's like a honeymoon period for that, I think. Mm -hmm. And then once that honeymoon period faded away, then it was, you know, isolation um, and also feeling um, disconnected with your cult, with their culture and their people. So I think, you know, I would say like a lot of the darker aspects of my work or some of the, you know, what people may perceive is, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's like violent or freaky or something like all that is like, you know, maybe a byproduct of that discomfort mm. that my parents had to um, experience moving, mm. moving to Thunder Bay. When you went to art school, you moved from Thunder Bay to Waterloo, mm -hmm. which is another smaller town. Um, but what was it about the, the school there or um, the type of people that you encountered there that most influenced um, the work that you were doing? I would say, you know, my friends in art school, my close friends, they're all from small towns. Uh, one's from Port Dover. Another mm -hmm. one is from Woodstock. And um, we kind of shared a similar sensibility where when you live in isolated places, you have to make your own fun or you also heavily grasp at you, you kind of heavily seek out culture that stimulates you and excites you. And this is like, you know, obviously pre-internet. So you had to do some digging to, to get these things, right? Like mail order, zines, um, records, and all that kind of stuff, comics, outsider things. So yeah, I think we, but there was also like an honesty, I guess, like, you know, my friends in art school, because they came from a small town, everyone was, you know, ha I don't think like, playing and like big city gamesmanship like that kind of that didn't really uh ex like exist or you know those aren't qualities that 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 were there present there mm -hmm. so i think that kind of idea of honesty like uh, being honest with yourself and honesty with your practice or what you're interested in, in making kind of um persevered in my practice where i i was like I don't care about this crispy, cold, conceptual stuff that doesn't move me or make me feel anything. Um, I know that's what contemporary art looks like and sounds like, but I didn't, yeah, like I, I think it, you know, that community kind of told me I, you know, I could kind of do what I felt was true and not feel pressured um, to sway myself into some other wave trend current um can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the works that i'm showing now none of which are yours but i know um each play heavily in the especially in the early uh work that you were doing yeah well the, there's the dr slump which is the two kind of manga anime um by akira toriyama and this is a cartoon I watched religiously as a kid. Uh, in Cantonese, it's called IQ Bopsi, which is IQ Professor. But it's a, this is the same guy that did Dragon Ball Z, which more people know about. Um, but it's a very like absurdist, exaggerated, uh, surreal comic book series. And it's also like subversive and kind of perverse and you know kids watched it but like i i think that the tangential quality of that show um carries through in the way i approach um my art practice in in the idea of like oh let's think of like the most um outlandish or weird tangent and see if it could be pursued um and then the two images uh, on the top left and the right that is artwork by the Chicago Imagists. On the right is a work by one of my professors in, at Waterloo, Art Green, who's awesome. And I think the other one's by Carl Worsom. But 
there, uh, you know, art was like one of the profs that kind of got what I was doing, even though my stuff was like, you know, cartoony, you know, and was, wasn't deemed high art by some other people or, you know, work that references comic culture uh, wasn't also was, was kind of looked down upon, but art understood me because the Chicago, Chicago images were very much inspired by comics and underground comics in that kind of um, like the sixties uh, era. And then they functioned also as an antithesis to the New York school of pop art and abstract expressionism. So I really, I really feel this kind of outsider vibe, this kind of second city. If we look at Chicago and Thunder Bay, you run a strip on a map, it's the Midwest. So it's like weird Midwest stuff. It's like Winnipeg artwork, weird mm -hmm. Winnipeg stuff. Mm -hmm. These are, art practices are emerging that are, you know, not, you know, authentic and true to themselves and not overly concerned about what's happening in New York and LA or, you know, any of these like major points that kind of influence the power structure of culture. Mm -hmm. and, that kind of west west of center, you might say. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then you went on from that kind of outsider perspective. Um, this is an example of some of the less colorful, um, but more formal and graphic work that you were doing um, almost immediately out of art school when you moved to Ottawa. Is that correct? Yeah, this sleep sheep is done in Ottawa. And that was near like a Staples, like off of Bank Street. Mm -hmm. And then these on the right are graphic images I made stencils of and spray painted. So on the street. So at this point, I was very interested in this like um, kind of disobedient art movement, outsider art movement that was kind of organized together, um, both out of New York and um, the West Coast, um, San Francisco, like artists like Barry McGee and Margaret Kilgallen. Um, you know, their art practices focused on kind of graffiti and um, outside, just sign painters, like just the, and, and folk art, you know, work by people that didn't go to art school, you know, just so I was kind of messing around with this because I liked the idea of, um, I guess, putting my art out in the streets or functioning in a non-institutional gallery setting. Mm -hmm. But I also didn't really like the big bravado and machismo of graffiti and the battling and the this is my name kind of a thing. So I was more interested in character design and, and putting kind of character stamps um, mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. And I think that um, that idea of character and um, kind of multi-layered um, figurative character work and that kind of mashup of forms and figures is something that um, we definitely start to see developing your work around this time. Um, and if you could speak to this slide a little bit, and I might move through um, a few other developments in that in your practice and we can talk about that yeah this image is from ha hatsuka um hakusai's manga which is um kind of a book of cart comics or illustrations that hakusai produced and kind of set the template up for you know modern day anime and manga mm -hmm. and when i saw this image it was in a library in a high school and Kitchener, KWC, KWCI. And um, I was immediately, um, gra I gravitated to the image because I really respected, like really was attracted to the line quality, mm -hmm. as well as this kind of, it's like both comical and historical, you know? Like, so there's this like, there's like a history to it. There's like a toothiness to it, but then it's also kind of fun. Um, and then formally, I was very attracted to it. So I started, um, I think for just a poster I, I, I did for an art show I had, I played and did some collage work using these images overlaid on top of each other and I was inked on top of it. And it was, all it was was a poster at Invisible Cinema or Worm Gallery, which was like a, 
uh, art house uh, video rental store in Ottawa yep. on Wednesday. And so all I did use did this thing with this mashups was for a poster, but I enjoyed the process so much um, that I started making these works um, using that process. And what I liked so much about the process was um, via collage, I could create these uh, portraits that were very unpredictable for me, where I, the, my agency of what the image looked like was relinquished a bit to what was the pre-existing um, elements in the collage. And then I could work off of that. So it, was a, it felt like a collaboration with Hakusai. Um, and then, you know, on a conceptual level, when I thought about it, there's these kind of mashed up hybrid figures and like on an identity tip, I kind of felt them relating to other peoples that have to exist in kind of a hybridized uh, spaces. So me, for instance, if I'm kind of Cantonese Canadian um, or, you know, Hong Kongers are also like kind of colonial British, kind of a certain kind of Chinese that escaped the cultural revolution. So there's all this like gray area. And I thought these, these portraits kind of were portraits of people in, in, that function in these liminal spaces. Um, they're also, I think, um, I saw them linked as well um, to surrealist uh, nature more games um that kind of game where you would draw and fold over the paper and some and have someone else add to it um but then i was also thinking about the way that they um play into the idea of the transformer um and i know a lot of us and you and children of the 80s were quite influenced by um transformer toys and i saw a lot of um parallels and links between the way that these characters seem to be able to either change or morph or are in the process of changing or morphing or taking on different identities depending on their um, situation or context. Mm, that's true. Um, and then I also, you know, for me the Transformers, there's definitely the meaning around the transforming for the conditions Mm -hmm. Formally, I always, I, I also like them because uh, all the, it's how fragment, like the fragmentation and how it's assembled. Mm -hmm. And then also for tact tactility, like there's a very manual aspect to like playing with those toys, but it's mm -hmm. also very uh, kind of like a, pu like a puzzle. So mm -hmm. I, think, you know, that, that ends up translating in, in even more of my you know, recent work, like if we look at Retainers of Anarchy, which is built up of all sorts of animations all interlocked together in this large kind of world. Um, and then these works also, which are kind of experiments in this scholar rock kind of robots, post-human thing, uh, literati map. This is kind of like a palette cleanser I did after Retainers of Anarchy, because it was so draining and I think it was like a four-year burn so I did these afterwards just to as a different channel of um creativity that was different yeah I um I recently saw a few of these um in Toronto and what struck me about them was definitely again that link towards um not just the transformer or the transformation of um, objects, but also the links that you often make in your work between historical or traditional means of representation and uh, very contemporary references. And um, I can see in them not also, uh, not only um, references to Asian art, but I also um, see some really interesting links between contemporary Inuit sculpture as well, um, which I think is quite fascinating. That's cool. You should curate a show. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> um, Justine mentioned to, uh, and I'm, I'm getting to it, but the, um, the different ways in which your drawing practice specifically um, has been linked to um, these kind of multi-layered uh, frescoes and the way that um, a lot of your recent drawing um, is trying to take 
uh, the medium to a different level or a new, um, a new way of drawing. And in these works in particular, which were created um, in Ottawa, you used a very untraditional medium to draw with. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, um, this is a series called Spectral Residue. And um, the story goes that I was doing an artist residency in Bay St. Paul um, one summer. And um, I had this really long sheet of rice paper that I had on a wall, a wall in my studio space. And I would use that sheet of rice paper as um, a ground for loose, gestural, expressive inkbrush mark making. It was to contrast with very rigid um, composed works I was also making at the same time, which was from the Horror Fables series. Mm -hmm. So closer to the end of that residency, it's kind of like, oh, people are gonna come see it. You gotta make your space respectable looking. Um, so then I removed, I was planning on putting all my kind of composed horror fables works up that were completed. So when I removed this rice paper uh, off the wall, I noticed all the ink and paint had saturated through and the paper was stuck. Then I was trying to remove it and it ripped and then the drawing was ruined. I was like, oh, so bad. Um, but then there's like, you know, the, the rice paper drawing was just crumpled on the ground like a dead body, but then imprinted on the wall was these faint marks that had bled through the paper. So it's like a spirit of the drawing. Mm -hmm. So it was also late at night. So I was feeling some, you know, kind of freaky Quebecois, like mountain vibes. Uh, so <laughs> I, I was starting to see things. I was starting to see faces, which is a very common brain thing, but so I wanted to tease out these faces I was seeing. And first I was using ink brush and stuff, but then it looked too deliberate and you could see the brush or the hand. But then I also had matches with me. So I started burning, trying to put the matches towards the wall to see if it could, what kind of marks it made. And I found out it was possible to kind of render or tease out faint images I saw using this match burning technique where it's like sulfur and smoke and stuff like that. So total accident. Um, and then ever since I sometimes do it to accompany some of my work, sometimes they're using installations. I haven't actually done that in about four, four years, but there's a new jam at the power plant and it mixes up with this whole other new trajectory I'm, I'm doing that involves like incense and like Taoist feng shui patterns. So it's that's a, a site specific <laughs> installation or yeah. a site specific drawing that you're working on right now. Yeah. Um, so again, thinking about the different ways that your, that your drawing practice is influenced. Um, I know that you had done quite a bit of research, um, on, uh, tattooing and that's what we're seeing here, right? It's the interior of a, um, a tattoo shop. For a tattoo artist studio? Uh, yeah, it's a tattoo artist in Hong Kong. And um, the research I had done was around how tattooing in Hong Kong came about, which was, um, I think an engineer was working on an army ship and he fell overboard and was rescued and ended up in a hospital in India. There, he noticed some sailors had some tattoos and he was like, this is cool. How does it, how do you do that? And then the sailor talked about tattoo guns. So the engineer got back to Hong Kong and then invented like a DIY tattoo gun. And then that's kind of how tattooing culture started in Hong Kong. My interest in this kind of research was around, well, outside of kind of subcultures, right? DIY spirit, um, which, which is very, you know, it relates to how, you know, sometimes how self-organized societies function, like how Chinatowns kind of got formed by, you know, people taking care of each other and, and figuring out ways to solve problems or to protect themselves or make a living or exist. Um, but this research was around a sculpture I had, which was a, uh, on a, martial arts kung fu dummy, a Wing Chun dummy. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I etched with a py pyrography pen all these new like little martial arts um, technique designs that I just made up on the body of this dummy. And that sculpture also produces um, percussive patterns based on motion. But uh, I won't go too deep into it. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's another, another um, way I was thinking too about um, drawing on the body or um, thinking about tattooing as being kind of a a visualization of a lot of the um, the histories that we tend to experience and a lot of people do you know get tattoos to commemorate certain experiences um, but also I've, I have an interest in that idea of you know memory being written on the body regardless of whether or not it's tattooed there in a in a visual sense um, just the way that all of these different um, memories of yours and different experiences um, end up being kind of written into you and into your practice as well. Um, this work is much more recent. Um, and before we get to uh, retainers of anarchy and kind of the video portion of the, the slides that I have organized, um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about, about this work. Um, this work, uh, well, the, the first, it started with the work on the goat parchment on the left. And um, I think I started it in 2018. But um, this is an extension of kind of imagery and themes that are in Retainers of Anarchy, which is um, a strategy I use where I conflated this genre of martial arts fantasy fiction, which I grew up uh, watching, and kind of conflating that with kind of more present day real socio-political situations in Hong Kong. It was like a way for me to like process everything that's going on there and the whole evaporation. Um, but this technique, and then formally the technique, I, I just enjoyed uh, making these very kind of elegant and lyrical mark like brush strokes because for about four years for retainers i was just you know making a lot of drawings on transparencies and um so it was a desire for me to get on to like get back and touch and feel really like exquisite fine material which is this like goat parchment um, and then the image on the right is the kind of inverse of this goat hide image. And it was kind of an accident that happened when I had a file that I scanned. And then I liked it. And then for me, it re re reminded me of like all the neon that I saw as a kid in Hong Kong, all the neon signage that was very prevalent there. Um, as well as, you know, all the illuminated um, movie posters and stuff when you're outside of a theater. So it was a, kind of like a negative, it's like a negative neon um, version, I guess, of the, of the unique work. Um, what I, again, find interesting and an interesting link between these works and say something um, from horror fables is that idea of um, the ghost or the ghost story uh, the idea of something again that exists like a memory or um, a, a remnant of something that we can't that we know say from storytelling or from childhood or from a movie that we don't always understand Kind of in the foreground of our of our consciousness where these ideas or thoughts or feelings come from but um i definitely see in a lot of your work where that kind of veil becomes quite murky and we get these kind of almost like flashbacks or that kind of cellular um layering of images upon images um and materials upon materials and stories on stories that kind of all go together not only to to develop your practice and your work but it's really it's a very personal relationship that you have to your artwork and I think that that goes back again to that um, 
not a not a rejection necessarily of the kind of that cold conceptualism but that desire that i see in your work um to really personalize it and to make it about something that is that is near and um impactful to you as an artist um throughout kind of your development or your growth yeah i think that's true um I think a lot of the, my practice is trying to figure all this stuff out that went down that when you're young, you're not processing all this stuff, right? Yep. You're just living it. Um, and I guess that's what happens when you're in your forties and you start, you're starting to look back at your life and stuff. And then you're trying to, you kind of slowly figure out how everything went down or how all this stuff is, uh, informing, informing my work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I was just looking at that, um, the last one with the, the, rem, the remnant you're talking about. It reminds me of like um, when I used to, you know, I, my mom had a Chinese Canadian restaurant and I also worked at a gas station. But it reminds me of, you know, I collected a whole bunch of these, like the old Visa, Visa cards, like carbon. Oh, like, yeah. Cause I liked, I was, I was like, I think I had a whole bunch and I still have a bunch. I do drawings on them and I love, I love like the, the positive and negative side mm -hmm. of it. And I never have, I always have a tough time figuring out which side I liked because they, they both have a beautiful quality to it. One's like etched and one has the unique thing on it. But you know, um, this is my whole nostalgia mind. I'm like, Oh, carbon. Like I, yeah. what a cool, it was like formally, like a, it's a really cool thing. Like, if someone could fabricate like a big ass sheet of like carbon printy material, I'd love to do a drawing on it and then like peel it off and then you get two. I'm sure it exists. Cool. I'm sure it's possible. Um, so you mentioned your mom's restaurant. So we're going back in time again, back mm -hmm. to uh, Thunder Bay. Um, and something that we've talked about a number of different times is this um, maximal aesthetic that you have developed. And as we start to talk more about, especially the video work in the show, um, that's a thread I think that we can can tease out a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, from what I figured out or what I think, you know, this is my mom's menu, small font, lots of information it's like very maximal very much I, I think i saw this and i was like this is like my work um very similar and you know i think it's a longing it's that longing for hong kong like that is you know that is the volume of processing that our brains like my family's brain wants to do mm. it wants a lot of prop to be processing a lot of things mm -hmm. so when you're in a very quiet and calm thunder bay with you know a slower chill pace there's almost like you know it's like an antsy city like an urban like person then you're just like a little bit like itchy or like a little twitchy with the foot because you're like oh I, this is going so slow like you know like um so i think that that translated my work where it's like i I want a density. I want, I want a puzzle. I want the experience to be puzzling or also be a visual puzzle. I want it to be overwhelming um, because it actually makes me feel comfortable, which is kind of, kind of a sick idea, but yeah, it's, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something when we're children, we don't really understand where that comes from necessarily. So I think I'm going to just for the interest of time, um, I'll come back to that, but this idea of longing for Hong Kong, I know I, I read, um, a very recent interview that you did, um, for a, a new online magazine here in Toronto, um, and the, um, interviewer asked you if you could go anywhere at any time, where would you go? And I thought your, your, um, answer was quite interesting, was that, you would um, go back to Hong Kong during the time that you didn't live there. So during the 80s and 90s. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what it was actually like to go back 
um, when you did? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, that answer was very back to the future. Like this, you know, the other path, like, you know, Biff gets the, I've been watching it with my kids. Um, but yeah, when I went back, it was, you know, I felt very, like I hadn't really thought about Hong Kong for a very long time, but I went back and everything, I felt so comfortable there. Everything felt so familiar. I took a shower and the smell of the water was, mm -hmm. I remembered it, like that olfactory kind of synapse. So there's some, something so comforting. And then just it, the city itself, affectively, is super inspiring. That's why there's like so many movies and video games that use Hong Kong as a backdrop, but they never say it's Hong Kong. But anyways, it's just like, it's lively. And that's why there are, you know, so many people, despite even having lived there for several years that moved away, everyone very open about how much I love it and the lifestyle and the culture and, and also very heartbroken as to what, what's transpiring there right now. So, um, but yeah, for me, in terms of my art practice, it was more of this kind of spatial thing that I realized once I was like, I realized all my instincts when I produce artwork, like formally matched up very well with the actual urban uh, space and of and visual environment of, of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a, you know, it was a it really kind of like, you know, it clarified everything for me. So I didn't have to feel insecure that my work was like this and maybe didn't look like other serious contemporary artwork. I would hardly say that your work was less serious though. I mean, I, I think of things like um, some of the drawings that you were doing, uh, I guess in the mid, mid 20, for 2015s, 2014s, um, where you were incorporating um, childhood fa uh, folk tales again, um, traditional fairy tales and folk tales and myths, um, but then also these wild and um, rather unbelievable yet very true stories of, of immigration from your family. Um, and I've recently been doing some research of my own on, sorry, <laughs> on um, Chinese scroll painting and drawing um, and thinking about the way that the unrolling of, of the scroll and the reading of the scroll um, was a very um, revered and kind of sacred process of opening the scroll and then having, you know, various pieces of it being unfurled and unfurled and unfurled. Um, and the way that painters from this particular period, the Sung period, would have um, tried to reconcile with ideas of um, natural order and the hierarchies in nature being um, commensurate with the hierarchies of, of the state and this kind of very harmonious um, intermingling of government and of nature. And I think um, thinking about that a little bit more in relation to um, your work, whether it's in drawing or in, um, in video, I think very much highlights the, uh, the fragmentation of that idea or the way that um, those ideas can be very much undone. In, in a specific visual language in the way that you kind of subvert that traditional visual language to speak about um, political and social um, atrocities that are very incommensurate with that um, harmonious um, relationship that is more so seen in traditional Chinese scroll painting. Yeah, it's uh, kind of a Trojan horse strategy right? Because 
I'll use the guise of these, you know, harm, so-called harmonious landscapes, um, but then destabilize them by, in this case, um, revealing this kind of ugly hist Canadian history of um, exile and isolation. Um, this work is unfortunate. It's of Darcy Island. It's about a Chinese Canadian leper colony um, on an island just west of Vancouver. So this is like me doing my little Canadian Chinese history and trying to understand the just um, I would say the practice like the practice of race discrimination and how it has just kind of mutated or um, evolved over time in BC at this at point. So you'd have an incident like this and then you have like the Chinatown riots in like 1909, um, the Kamagata Maru. Um, and then, you know, this was me kind of adjusting to living to, in Vancouver because I was, had not lived in a space that was as so clearly delineated um, based on ethnic group uh, and class as Vancouver is. So I was trying to, I was trying to like, Deal with deal with that as a new resident there about this kind of partitioning, and this work is kind of speaks to that. Mm -hmm. And I think too, it, this work um, also retains its timeliness today as well as we start to uncover or recover or um, understand the way that uh, different uh, colonial and government oppression is not something that's um, disappeared, especially in our, in our culture, um, today. The same stuff. I thought about that work. Oh, of course now because of COVID it's like isolation. It's like the infected other. Like when I hear news stories of like Asian people getting like spat on, sweared at, punch in the face, mm -hmm. um, in the States, like knifed. Um, I think about this work again, and it's unfortunate that this work is still resonant actually i'd rather i'd rather this work was like you know played out and didn't resonate with our current circumstance but unfortunately it's it's kind of still here still here um i want to be aware of the time um but i'd like to talk about uh retainers of anarchy um, and maybe if you can kind of tell us the story of Retainers of Anarchy, I will um, flip through the slides accordingly. I'll try to do it fast. Yeah. So <laughs> one of those images you showed, um, that time I went back to Hong Kong after not going back for 25 years, the hear me all contemplating and stuff. This one, yeah, this one. So I went, my uncle got me tickets to see this thing, the River of Wisdom an animated scroll of that scroll that you also had an image of. Um, so when I saw it, I was like pretty blown away, but mostly because it was kind of tech cool and also the scale of it. Um, and I was interested in the scroll format from Horror Fables. So I was like, oh, an animated version of the scroll. And it was something I had already tinkered with the idea with, because I did a project in Vancouver at Center A um, using magic lantern projectors, which my, your, your partner helped help me with, actually. Um, but that was like pre-animation, pre but I was playing with ideas of media and the moving image in a very archaic sense. So when I saw this, I was like, it would be great to do an animated scroll and somehow subvert whatever I'm seeing here, which later, once after all the affect of the scale of the work passed, I was like, oh, so you're just kind of purporting this very socially harmonious society, all living very well and everything's all good. But this is like happening at a time when in Hong Kong, people are feeling uneasy about what their lives will be like once, you know, the handover once 2047, once this 50 year promise of autonomy um, ended in 2047, but right now it's 2020 and it's already over. So 
Um, so yeah, I wanted to subvert that. And I, cause, cause in my practice, I always tend to like focus on certain genres. I move through like pop culture genre phases. I knew when I was finishing up horror fables, which was a ghost stories kind of genre era that I wanted to move into this martial arts fantasy fiction one, because I also have, um, young kid nostalgic, um, attachments to it. Um, so I wanted to produce a scroll, but with martial arts fantasy fiction animated. And then when I did research around the genre of martial arts fantasy fiction, I didn't realize how it was deemed um, very controversial by the government in China at the time. And it was censored and the practitioners, you know, relocated to Hong Kong where they could safely write stories about martial artists like flying in the skies. Um, but, it, you know, in the narrative of these martial arts stories, there's a subtext for independence, autonomy, and resistance against, you know, authoritative em emperors and, and like, you know, suppressions of freedom. Like these martial artists, they fought with a code, just like in the wild, wild west, there's a code. But these codes are not like solid codes they're kind of self-organized codes they're very kind of loose and they're they're you know a, it's like a community decides what this code is right um so I, I also enjoyed that this idea of like what is right and wrong and how that is determined is via a populace or a community not from the top down saying this is right or wrong um so that's how it all started <laughs> um and could you tell us just a little bit about um, the city that it was based on and um, maybe a little bit about the design? Yeah, the, the, in, the, in terms of the environment, I wanted to interject this very notorious uh, place called the Cowlin Walled City into the work to kind of de destabilize this very bucolic um, landscape. And, um, you know, a lot of people have made work on it about the Kellen Wall City because it's such a marvel of humanity because it, I don't know how much of the history I should get into, but it was, you know, it existed, you know, out kind of between, in a liminal zone between British ruled Hong Kong and mainland China. And um, there was, it was not governed. So there's no authorities kind of, kind of policing the area and it ended up becoming a kind of organically growing community. Mm -hmm. People tapped into the electrical system, people tapped into the wells, um, unlicensed dentists, unlicensed, you know, manufacturing happened there and then they would offer their goods at a cheaper price than what was offered at licensed places, but all the goods and services were just as good, if not better. Um, but then it was also run by the triads. Um, it was like a haven for drug use, but then there's also like churches in there and people finding faith. And, um, so it was like, and it's like one of the, it was the densest place in the world for a very long period of time. And for me, I thought it was a very good kind of allegory for this martial arts universe with a lot of like outsiders and independent kind of spirit and this idea of a self-organized code of um, conduct. And then also this friction between social order and chaos and what, who defines what is order and what is chaos. Like in a way there's an order there, but it may seem chaotic, but it's, they have a system. And so what was the system that you created for retainers of anarchy? How did that, how did that work? Well, I think this idea of order and chaos extends into the formal aspects of the work via the programming, which is the idea I'll give credit to, to Remy Siu, who's an artist that I collaborate with who did all the programming. And, um, you know, when retainers, I had the idea, I, I, I talked to him and I was like, what do you think of this animated scroll idea? And he's like, yeah, it's possible, 
but we're not like a major factory producer. You know, we're not like, a, there's not a team of like 50 animators and like all this CGI rendering stuff. It's just like a team of like four people. But he threw out the idea. It's like, what if the work was algorithmic? What if there was no start or end? Mm -hmm. What if we let the computer make the decisions as to how it traverses this world? In a way, it's genius because we didn't want to make all these decisions, in all honesty. There's so many assets everywhere. So what we do is we compose the work up to a certain point. We frame it up to a certain point and, and, then, and then we allow the computer to kind of, kind of run and, and move about in the work as it pleases. We provide numbers, ratios of frequency of how something may or may not happen. So there's a bit of, you know, hands on, hands off, like, you know, kind of deity play, but also letting the computer be like an AI kind of, it, let the computer kind of be its own, be itself, you know. So when, when people view the work, um, since unfortunately um, people in attendance tonight probably may not have seen the work, although it has been shown um, in Vancouver and uh, in Ottawa and elsewhere. Um, what's interesting in the way that this work kind of encapsulates so many different um, aspects of your work is that we do have that kind of um, large unfolding scroll narrative. Um, again, taking on that traditional idea that the scroll would encapsulate the human, overtake the human, and the viewer becomes a part of the work in a way that they are directed through its unfurling. In this case, rather than the scroll being unrolled, we're having a computer program kind of take us through the narrative. Um, but what we then also have is a very traditional looking, um, scroll painted landscape overlaid with this very dense um densely designed yet organized ap apartment or city dwelling that we get zoomed in and out of these different um these different narrative scenarios that are kind of based around as you say um kind of traditional stories and also these renegade um, martial arts characters. Um, and there's an incredible soundtrack as well. Um, but what, what I find so captivating about this work too, now that you've just been talking about it, is this interest in algorithms that I think only in the last couple months we've all become so much more aware of in the way that um, contemporary digital narrative and digital life is kind of controlled by very strategic, very algorithmic um, programs based around our different interactions with social media. And I don't, I don't think that when this work was being created three years ago, that that was even um, even as quite as prevalent as it is today. So hearing you say that now um, triggers a whole slew of other um, ideas and relevancies in this project that uh, perhaps weren't, uh, weren't as prevalent um, when it was being made. Yeah, we knew it, it, they existed, but yeah, they did, I guess it, it was still more a little bit more opaque at that point. Yeah, we were definitely, um, yeah, not so much living the algorithms the way that we seem to be, um, especially like right now. Um, I can, the video that's in the end of this presentation is, um, is it from Retainers? Is it Parallax? It depends. Parallax. Oh, it might be parallax, yeah. yeah. Um, a, do you want to preface it a little bit and I'll play a little bit so that people have a, a sense of kind of what to expect and then we'll open the floor to questions. Yeah, I think 
I guess people can probably start typing in questions. Yeah. As playing. Yeah. Um, Parallax is sort of the sibling, uh, the next chapter after retainers. It's a single channel algorithmic animation, but I think after we, when we completed retainers, you know, my team and I felt there was, we had just started getting the hang of it, or there was more we wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, especially like the rooms in the Kowloon Walled City, I think we ran out of time, so we couldn't put so many animated rooms in there. So a lot of people were like, yo, if you're ready, um, we can do some more. And I thought of this new framework Currently, it's single channel, but maybe in the future, it might be three channel. But the idea of is just focusing on rooms. And um, so it's a bit, way more confined um, because th there's, there's only a certain instance where it breaks into a landscape. Um, but, it, you know, there's cycles of rooms. They, I, I envision it very much like a slot machine. Like you pull the handle and then you get like cherry, nine, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's how the work functions. And it, you know, there's things involved in it that we didn't do in retainers, like lighting design. So there's very uh, lighting design and a lot of like little variable things. So when you actually see the work, it doesn't seem as vast and complex or dense as retainers, but it actually maybe has more programming in it or has a more little, little, it, you know, little, little, variables tweaks hmm. so and um probably single channel because doing a five channel edge blend seamlessly is very difficult so it's also probably formally smart to not you know to go single channel and that it wouldn't be so um how would i say it restrictive to present it in a lot of places because yeah. i find retainers requires a certain space and scale and it's it's quite restrictive for a lot of galleries to try to present it so I thought, um, but yeah it, it's looking great at the power plant from the from the photos that i've seen um yeah. it's kind of a perfect space so oh there's so much more i could say but i know we're we're already stretching our time so i'll play a little portion of the video and if people want to take a moment to um type some questions into the chat we'll handle those uh after the short video presentation That's just a, a very small taste of um, some of the amazing video work that um, is included in this exhibition. Yes. And it's also the old version of it. So it's, it's ongoing work. So we've been constantly adding some new assets to it and kind of improving the programming also. Yeah. So what, we got a Q&A here? We got a Q&A going. Um, so Karen asks, did you get in trouble for using fire to draw? <laughs> um, um, the residency, yeah. Hmm. They didn't know, but it is. it was in a hockey arena in Bay St. Paul. So it was fine. I think people were like, you know, smoking in the residency space anyways so it it was as if i was lighting a match to have a cigarette but let the match burn a little longer yeah they were cool with it um that's it 
Are there any other, <laughs> are there any other um, questions from the audience? Um, maybe about Howie's process or something that we sped over too quickly. Um, maybe not. We were just so thorough that there are no questions. That's good for me. Yeah. Look at that. We can still see the name of people though. Just yeah, we can see who's here. The names. Oh, oh, there's actually questions in the chat and not the Q and A. Okay. Um, so there's one here. From Remy? Uh, sure, do you see that one from Remy? Yeah. Oh, I have another one too as well. Okay, do that one. Um, so this person is wondering if Howie, you could define and talk about um, martial heroes as a genre and how they relate to immortal heroes or immortal. mysterious fantasy. Oh, I know those ones. It's like uh, Sangu. Mm -hmm. Sangu is like, it's like God, God stories, like deity stories. Like it, mm -hmm. in Chinese culture, there's like a lot of different deities. So there's like fantasy stories that focus on these uh, deities and their beefs and dramas. And then, yeah, the martial arts stories, that's the one, you know, my work is kind of mm -hmm. focused on. Sometimes there are movies that hybridize um, both of those genres. So they're both martial artsy and kind of deity, like heavenly figures and they, how they interact um, mm -hmm. and yeah, with each other. Um, and there's one here from Remy, who's a different Remy, who's asking, have you ever experimented with materials to draw that completely failed or that didn't work the way you wanted them to? Well, that totally didn't work. Hmm. I'm not like, I, I wouldn't say I'm one that is super experimental with like using like strange drawing or, out, you know, outside of the box drawing materials. So this smoking thing was just kind of like an accident and mm -hmm. it worked, but I haven't, you know, if I had to respond to him, I'd be like, I just, I'll try something strange or when something strikes that it might or may not work. But for most of the time it's been, they've been working. Yeah. All the, if, like the pyrography pen was, came out the way I imagined. And I mean, you, you tend to work in, in quite traditional materials uh, for drawing as well. Try yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one question here from Lacey who's asking, do you find that people struggle to understand your work if they're unfamiliar with um, historical uh, Chinese aesthetic or influences or stories? I find that there's definitely Obviously, people are not going to understand where all this stuff is coming from, but mm -hmm. there's catalogs and all sorts of text and all this other online stuff. So it's about if people experience the work mm -hmm. and it's like, yo, I feel something. Yep. I want to learn more. Exactly. Those resources are out there. Yeah. So, and I, yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, your work has so much detail in it that there's a vast amount of um, learning that anyone can do um, looking mm -hmm. at your work or work by other artist who's working in any other tradition that we don't understand. I think that that's something. Oh, frozen? What is this? Do we have a time? Oh no, you're back. I see you. I'm back. Um, I was just going to say that it's just such a fantastic time of contemporary art right now to um, to learn about different cultures and to look closely. And that's something that um, I find about your work especially is that regardless of the density and the kind of map inspire a very close looking and a long looking and a sustained period that the viewer spends with the work as opposed to just uh, kind of a surface glance which yeah. i think is 
a way that we all learn about different cultures or could learn about different cultures. Yeah, like, you know, my hook is like, you know, martial arts fantasy fiction isn't that oblique. Like there's coaching, there's all sorts of pop culture things that are out in the ether that are very um, accessible hooks to get you versed or as an introductory point. Mm -hmm. And then um, I also find in the work, there's a lot of other areas, like if you're interested in like urban, urban design or yeah. so many areas you can di dig into whatever your interest is there's there should be a, an entry point yeah um and i think we have time for um one last question here there's a question uh from karen again who asks who do you imagine your audience to be i've sort of stopped i i don't think about the audience i guess that's the question a previous question too it's like you know, it's, I'm making the work because I, I guess I, I'm passionate about making it or want to see this thing in, come to life. And then you just deal with the rest, you kind of deal with the rest later, you know. You, audience shouldn't dictate what kind of work you make no. or a preconceived notion of what a pers prospective audience could be, you know. Mm -hmm. I ain't serving y'all. Good. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm losing sunlight here in my office in Toronto, as you can see. Um, so I think that this is a great time to, uh, to wrap the conversation. And thank you for chatting with me today and participating in this. Um, and I know that the show is going to be amazing. Um, and it's up until January. So even if people can't see it right now, um, It'll be up for a while. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, thank Manon you. For doing the heavy lifting on this. No problem. It was fun. PowerPoint jumble concept that we have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you later. I'll maybe see you at the opening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to Howie and to Rhiannon for that really. Uh, interesting thought-provoking conversation um i think howie's work is just so intense um my name is josh human i'm the curator of education and public programs at the power plant uh really so appreciative of howie and rhiannon spending this time talking about howie's work um extremely appreciative of Stephen Foster, um, Dean of Art at OCAD University and his colleagues who have made this co-presentation possible. Um, my colleague Justine uh, did a great job um, sort of framing uh, this discussion. Um, as has been mentioned, our fall exhibitions will open officially on Saturday, September 26th. Um, there will be uh, online sort of like timed visits. Um, please bring your masks. Uh, please arrive just a little bit early before your uh, designated time. Uh, but we will be delighted to welcome you in to see not only Howie Choi's work, uh, but also Manuel Mathieu and Nathan Eugene Carson. For information about upcoming public programs, which are all being presented online, uh, please visit thepowerplant.org. Thank you so much and have a good evening, everyone.